The following presentation was recorded by View Digital Media at the inaugural Southeast Linux Fest in Clemson, South Carolina on June 13, 2009. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit southeastlinuxfest.org. All right. Hi. How are you? I'm Chris. I have a new laser. Uh, can we kill the house lights up here? Because it's violet. So... Because, you know, green is very 2004, and, uh, and blue is sort of 2007, and, you know. Can you see it okay? Is it making your eyes freak out because it's violet? Isn't that awesome? It takes, like, these two CR2 batteries, and I'm sure it's melting them down because of the extra power requirements. And if you look at it directly, I'm sure you'd be blind. So that's, that's my new laser. Um, and that, that's my presentation. Thank you for coming. Uh, okay, so uh, he mentioned this is what I do for a living. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to talk about the, the incredibly glamorous world of open source license compliance for very much, um, but it's actually a very important part of what I do. I've always thought that sort of the base behavior of a company in open source was using software within the boundaries of the license. Because uh, if you screw that up, you can't do any of the really, really fun things in open source, um, like Android and the rest. So, so, so I've, we've spent a lot of time on, on doing that at Google and making that easy. And and a similar amount of time making it very easy for Googlers to release software. And so some of what you'll see today is the result of that. See, now you can see the laser even better. Check it out. <laughs> All right. Uh, and then I can talk and show off lasers. Um, actually, I owned a laser 15 years ago that I took out of a... You don't really care about this, but I do. Uh, I, took, I, I took it out of a, la a laser printer and powered it with this external power supply, and it was like, this big, and I actually took it to a conference once. <laughs> People were like, what the? Anyway, um, yeah, so, so I run compliance, release from, of code from the company, uh, Summer of Code, and I've, I've picked up more teams now. I just released a, a new project called All for Good, uh, which matches up volunteering and volunteering opportunities. So if you want to volunteer for anything ever, you can go to that. And we're doing about 10 queries per second right now, which is about a million page views a day, which is pretty cool, or 100,000, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, but that's all open source, too, so if you want to look into what that site looks like, you can go see that. Um, but yeah, let's continue. Uh, the agenda, it's, it's very simple. It's me, questions, and that's it. Um, <laughs> we know who this guy is. It's funny, because I, I gave this exact talk, I think, in Malaysia. And they're all like, and they all laugh, but it was like a different kind of laugh. They're like, <laughs> they're like, and you have to explain, well, this is a noted shyster who shows up on late night television. And they all went. <laughs> so I guess they have their own, just speaking Malaysian or whatever. Um, so I wanted to start with sort of talking about where we've been for a few moments, where we are right now, which is sort of the meat of the talk, and then... Um, you know, what I think the future will bring us. Um, as part of my job, we do a lot of sort of research into sort of the nature of open source code. And we've taken the Google Code Search product and use that as a corpus to do some interesting studies about. So, so you'll see sort of some of the results of that in, the, in that section. But let's talk about the past. Um, a, lot, a lot of people forget about this part of open source, but it really goes to the heart of why open source is cool and fun and interesting. So on the left, uh, this is... Uh, uh, Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie uh, working on the first Unix that ran on, on an early uh, microcomputer. That's a microcomputer. Uh, <laughs> you can tell because of the, the bigness of it. Um, and, and they presented their new system Unix um, at a conference at Purdue University where a young Kirk McCusick was, see I'm using my laser, isn't that cool? Uh, where young Kirk McCusick was, was attending. He was, uh, I think, a graduate student at the time, and he thought this Unix stuff was pretty cool. And as he matriculated and went over to Berkeley, uh, he said, well, why don't we implement our own version of this? And, you know, over time, um, he came out with the first uh, of what we think of as BSD, but he, he really got hooked on Unix at the time, and he thought, well, you know, if we can share these ideas, and this was a bare two years after I was born, so that should give you an idea of how long ago this was. Um, you know, if we can share these ideas about how we can take computer science, then we can, we can move the whole science forward, we can move, you know, and he wasn't thinking about industry or, you know, career or the rest so much. He was thinking about, you know, where can we take computers and, and why is that awesome? Um, and, and so by 77, he had a good enough version. Everyone was using it. It was used as the basis for the first Suns and Apollos and HP workstations. And it spawned many derivatives that we think of as the BSD 
open source world today. And, and a lot of people don't talk about BSD, but it's up until about 2002, it had pretty much parity uh, from a deployment standpoint on the internet. Um, and, and only when multi-core and multi-CPU processors came out did, did Linux really start to outperform BSD in some situations. Um, and it still has a remarkable amount of, of market share on the internet. And, 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 and people ignore it and, and don't talk about it and, and don't see how great it is. And, and it's always surprising to me because it also, it's the ethics behind BSD that, that we all identify with in open source. Um, yes. Anyways, sometime later, uh, SendMail, uh, formerly called Deliver, which was used to basically move around host files among the early Unix machines at Berkeley, uh, turned into SendMail and it started evolving to send mail. Uh, email as we know it. Uh, that's Eric with his beer. Um, like I said, this is the past. He, he drinks wine more now. And, uh, <laughs> and around 83, as you know, uh, the Free Software Foundation was formed and the GPL codified Richard's ideals behind his thinking around free software. And what you have to realize is the ideals behind BSD and SendMail and the Free Software Foundation is really what we're talking about when we talk about open source. It's really what we're talking about when we talk about licenses. And if you understand the ideals and the genesis of these people and th these projects, you have a really good feel for what they expect of you when you use them. So that's pretty awesome. Um, like I said, a lot, of, a lot of you know all this stuff. So I know this is review. But uh, especially the guy with the red hat probably knows this. Um, <laughs> but, you know, in 93, Red Hat started. You know, Mark Ewing and, and Bob Young sort of got together. They flooded a couple of apartments with Donnie Barnes, and they launched Red Hat. And, no, seriously, that's the, you know the story about the toilets overflowing. Uh, and then they got kicked out of their apartment because they were running a business there. And Yeah, anyway. Uh, <laughs> and at the same time, Fintronic, which became VA Linux, which became VA Research, which became whatever until SourceForge. And, and the first official release of BSD, as we think about it today, FreeBSD came out then. And so there's a lot of exciting things going on. Um, but then the internet hit, right? So up until, you know, 94, a lot of people thought of the internet as being this academic thing, a way of sharing Gopher and Archie and IRC and, and dystopy stuff. And, and, and people had started to use it for email, but not strongly yet, uh, the way that we do now. Um, and then the web came. And the web was awesome. Right? And, and NCSA uh, sort of released the code in something called Shambhala, which became Apache, which we all know now, and has about 65, 70% of all the websites in the world running on it. Right? And again, Apache also became a licensing philosophy, a lot like BSD. Take the code, enjoy it, use it. You don't have to share back, but just let people know that you used some Apache code. You know? Very simple sharing. And these ideals, they just keep on coming up and up and up. And if you look at them, they're very, very simple. You have the people who want you to share if you use their code. You have the people who don't really care if you share or not, so long as you know, let people know that you're using their code. And there's a little bit in between, but this is sort of slumpy. Um, and, and it's all keyed on distribution. So if you don't ship it out, they don't really care what you do with their code, any of these people. Uh, and, and that's where we are now. So there's a lot of code on the Internet. We counted it all. Um, <laughs> I had an intern do it. No, uh, no, no, I had computers. We, Google has a lot of computers. We have like 15, 16 computers now. And so, uh, <laughs> anyway, so, so we looked across all the code and we broke it down by license. You know, and this is literally billions of lines of code, right? Um, and, and when you look at the licenses, you see about 48, 49% GPL, about 23% LGPL, and then permissive licensing pretty much encompasses the rest with some odd ducks here and there uh, for you know, the MPLs and the rest over in that sort of call out over there. Uh, I, I once gave a presentation where literally the projector stopped working at this point, so I was describing a pie chart. It was kind of, it, it was pretty interesting. Um, yeah. So, uh, but the point of this, this slide is, you know, some people are afraid of the GPL and even the LGPL. I've given this talk at defense contractors and others, and they're like, well, we're very afraid of blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, well, then just stay over here, you know? No, no one's going to be sad if you stay over here, and you won't be either. Because one of the things we found at Google, especially when we were creating Android, and our, our guiding philosophy around licenses in Android was just to stick with Apache whenever possible and BSD whenever possible. If you found a, a library under the GPL and LGPL, you could often find it, or an equivalent, in, in BSD and Apache lands. So if your politics goes more towards the, the permissive licenses the way, that, the way that, that ours does, 
you can usually find what you need. And, and remember, you know, this, this is sort of a funny slide because it's a pie chart, right? And so it de-emphasizes the scale of things. You know, this is, this is 500 million lines of code, we figure, maybe even more. And we'll have an exact number uh, at OSCON later in the year. But I mean, you know, 500 million lines of code is a staggering amount of development. You know, a really solid developer, they say, could create, you know, a thousand lines of code in, in, in say, a week, right? Um, and so if you're good at using this kind of code, you're like 5,000 developers, right? Or, what? no, uh, 5 million developers. So, you know, for a given week. Right, uh, and that, that's just staggering and crazy and insane. If you're, if because a, a crappy developer is thought of as doing 100 lines of code, solid code a week, right? Um, so, so there's this incredible amount of functionality out there. So, and you know, Google, to give you an idea, we have um, probably about 8,000 people who code every day, right? So, poof, any one of you can be bigger than the entire technical staff at Google, right? And now the reality is we we're happy to use this code too at Google, so uh, <laughs> so so good luck with that. But uh, <laughs> but seriously, you know, if you're thinking about uh, a software development organizations, most of them are quite small, right? So if you can just become good at using the code that's out there, you can bring an incredible amount of productivity into your company, into your hobby, into your fun, right? And that's pretty awesome. And I'm stepping on someone's laptop. Sorry about that. Who's always? Power book is down there. I was like, wow, that's giving a lot. What's, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't break it, I, I don't think. Otherwise, I guess I'm buying another laptop for somebody. Um, and it, so at the same time, right now, we're at about, I, actually, I don't know if that top number is true. I really need to update it and recheck it. Um, but right now, about 30% of the internet's running Linux, but similar amounts running BSD. There's probably a little more Linux now than BSD. By some amount, BSD is, and and forgive the reference, uh, BSD is loved by the porn business. Um, and no, no, seriously, I'm, I'm not. You know, it's just it's a fact. And so you see a lot of Oprah representation of BSD in in, in that very popular segment of the internet. Um, and then uh, Linux is deceptive though, because people say, well, you know. We don't know what's behind the firewall at Yahoo. I mean, yeah, we do. It's Linux for the most part, and a bunch of BSD, um, about half and half there. Uh, they say, "Well, we really don't know what's behind the firewall." At Google. He's like, "Yeah, we do. It's it's Linux." I can tell you, every single time you're using Google, you're using Linux. Everybody, every single time. So, you know, uh, so and and like uh, you know, they they had this noted story where they're like, you know, there's less Apache because of Google, and I'm like, what are you talking about? That's ridiculous. You know, first of all, we're not 5% of the internet, so I don't see how you could justify taking 5% off the top for Apache. But anyway, um, and we actually use Apache like crazy at YouTube. So anyway, um, so, so that's, that's operating systems. Uh, other internet stuff, you see about 90%, 98% of all DNS and bind is still going through open source software. You know, basically, it is logical to say that when you're using the internet, you're using open source all the time for pretty much everything. Unless you hang out on Microsoft Live a lot. But even that, you know, they recently bought PowerSet, which runs Linux, which, I, I don't know, might stick in their craw a little bit, but I mean, it's just how it is, right? So it's pretty exciting, you know? It's a pretty exciting world for open source. Um, and, and it's not just internet serving. As you know, this is the stuff, I know you guys already know this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, you know, it's everything. It's content management systems, it's PBXs, as you heard from Mark Spencer earlier, it's, it's games, as you might have heard from Ryan, I don't know if Ryan's in the room. I mean, it's, it's everything. You know, if, if you can think of something, there's somebody in the open source world who's enthusiastic about it. If you go back, you know, 10 years, I used to give these interviews and they're like, yeah, you know, maybe people like it for the odd, the odd website, but they'll never use it for file servers. And you're like, well, you know, Sam is used a lot. And they're like, well, maybe they're using it for file servers, but it's not real com you know, computer science or anything. And you're like, well, what about the ZDA stuff? What about this over there? They're like, well, yeah, but they never use it for business applications. And you're like, what about the CRM crap? And they're like, all right, just get out of my office. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, people would, like, plant these stories about how Linux wasn't serious, how it sucked, how it was insecure, and it's like, you know, I, are you even paying attention? And the reality is, you know, the war metaphor, the fight, people love to write about the fight because it's exciting and drives page views and anyway. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's all out there. And it's all out there under a variety of licenses. There's so much open source code that, you know, whatever your ideals around sharing are, you can usually find something that works with you. And that's pretty awesome. So, anyway. Okay. So that's good. So that's where we are right now. If you, if you have a, an iPhone, if you have a, an iPod, if you have a digital camera, if you have a Bluetooth headset, you know, as likely as not, everything in there was written using GCC. 
um, you know, I, I went to, again, that defense contractor, and they said, well, you know, we don't use any open source, so we're cool. You know, we just want to learn about it. And I'm like, okay. And then by the time I got there to give the speech, I was like, hey, I want to congratulate you on your open source adoption. They're like, well, what are you talking about? And I'm like, oh, well, you're using it here, 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 and, and the following products couldn't ship without it. They're like, really? And I'm like, yeah, really. You know, you don't think you actually bought a new compiler for that, did you? And, and you're using GCC. And they're like, but, 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 and it's like, yeah, you know? And they're like, but we, we don't use any of that stuff for our website or anything. And I'm like, yeah, well, yeah, you know, your, your Sun One web server uses OpenSSL. And they're like, Really? I'm like, yeah, really. <laughs> you know, I mean, it would be dumb not to. You know, why do why do you want to adopt something that you know is going to be insecure? I mean, why don't you go with OpenSSL? Because we already know how it's been hacked. You know, and they're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. And, and that was a fun talk to give. Obviously, it's used everywhere on the internet, right? Uh, this is Yandex, by the way. I, I, the first time I gave this was in uh, was in Russia, so I threw in a Russian search engine to be all cool like that. Um, <laughs> and like literally, I had to like get this properly translated. They're like, "Oh, we're using this diacritical mark wrong." And I'm like, "All right, you know." But yeah, this is Yan Dex. Just if you ever go to Russia, I have my name in 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 Russian too somewhere. Not on this talk. Not that you care. Uh, <laughs> so that's where we are today. So so here's where I talk about Google and how awesome we are. Now. Um, I won't bore you with that too much, but I will. Um, so we use open source. Like I said, every time you go to Google, you're using Linux every single time. Um, our software engineering desktops, you know, about half of them are running Linux. We're running a, uh, basically a version of Ubuntu that uh, ties into our file servers and stuff. We like it a lot. Um, all of our build tools, linkers, compilers, debuggers, languages, um, and literally hundreds, probably actually realistically thousands of libraries at this point. Um, and then we used to not run a, much Apache. I think I just got electrocuted by my laser. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a sample. Um, you know, uh, we used to not use much in the way of Apache, um, but as we've been doing acquisitions as a company, especially large ones like YouTube, uh, with, with lots of installed base, we've learned to start using it well. Uh, before, what we would do is we would buy a company, we'd port them over to our infrastructure, because that scales very, very well and is very monitorable by us. So, but yeah, so use a fair amount of, of Apache web servers now. That used to not be the case. Um, and then we release a lot of software. Um, we patch into hundreds of, of projects every month. I'm very proud of this. We, we try to keep it very low touch uh, from an oversight perspective, so it's hard to give you an exact number for patches. Um, but yeah, we're all over the place, and it's it, and, and it's good, you know, because if you look at especially hiring for teams like our kernel team, our compiler team, knowing that they can patch out is very, very important to them. And it's important to me personally, but it's nice that we're able as a company to do that. Um, we released uh, a number of small projects, about one a week right now, um, about 300 of them, uh, and that's not counting API examples, which would add another couple hundred. Um, and those are everything from small dev tools, whether it's like the first things we released are our memory allocation routines, our threading libraries, and that kind of thing, um, to full linkers. You know, it's very targeted at developers. So that's a good thing. You know, we released our MySQL replication patches uh, around 4x MySQL, um, which was very popular. And we were very proud of that, actually, because MySQL kind of didn't want them. Um, because they were already on the fives. And so they're like, eh, we don't care. And we're like, okay, so we released it anyway. And, and it found this great community of users. Uh, and who then wanted to buy support from MySQL, which was pretty funny. Uh, <laughs> and they're like, you know, uh, they're like, that doesn't seem like it's for version five. And they're like, no, it's not. But we use for it. And they're like, okay. Uh, <laughs> it was a bit of drama that was pretty funny at the time. Um, so yeah, so this is the day-to-day -day patching that is is sort of like, this is the fundamental, this is the infrastructure, this is the, the greasing of the wheels of the open source process that's actually really, really important. Because the problem with very large companies um, that aren't like Red Hat that are open source from the core up, you know, is that you, you get really in, sorry about the laptop again, I'm just going to move this. There you go. Harder to step on now. Oh, it's not a MacBook, it's like a Dell, I'm sure it'll be fine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's silvery, you see. That's branding for you. Um, so, where was I? Yeah. So, in, in large companies, you know, we can we can become very inwardly focused, and unless you start a project with the idea it's going to be open source from the get go, it can be hard to open source it because it'll be tied into a lot of systems that you haven't opened yet, or maybe aren't 
well suited to opening depending on your perspective. And so having like constant release going on all the time has been an important part of what we do. And so if you go to the open source blog, just you know, every other post is, we released a little thing here, go check it out. And we actually don't blog much about the patching, but that's really, really important. Uh, letting Google engineers feel that they you know, can just submit a bug, submit a patch, after a trivial first review that they're not insane is pretty great. Um, so yeah. But then we have these big projects, right? And the first really big project, and by big I mean usually generally larger than say 500,000 lines of code, you know, with a greater strategic impact, uh, and that kind of thing. So, you know, one of the problems we had earlier on, how many of you program websites for a living? You know, and, and so how many of you have wanted to kill yourself over that last edit for IE6? <laughs> <laughs> or Safari, or Chrome, or whatever, right? Uh, often you'll find that there's like, you have to tweak it just a little bit to make it work with that last browser. Um, and we have that problem all the time at Google, as you might imagine. You know, we, we try to go for these lively ajax -y interfaces, which means pain. Um, and so an enterprising group in Atlanta, another of your southern brethren, um, decided that they wanted to attack this problem head on, and actually via Java, which was uh, interesting. So we have three primary languages at Google, Java, C++, and Python. And so the idea that you could basically use your regular Eclipse sort of IDEs to develop web interfaces that didn't suck and didn't look like Swing uh, was pretty cool, right? And so, you know, we released this, uh, released this, this was almost four years ago <coughs> now, maybe three and a half. And it's one of those things where I have to admit, when I heard about it and we were working with them to maintain licenses, I was like, is this really going to be used much? I mean, you know, it's Java and, you know, it's Java, you know? And, <laughs> and, so, and we've always been very consumer focused and consumers, do they like Java? You know, it's that kind of thing. And, and I was shocked at how much people downloaded this. And what we found was it wasn't the typical sort of from the hip hacker who was downloading it, but, but it had this popularity behind the firewalls in large organizations that was shocking. And probably shouldn't have been shocking if I could remember my days back when I was, you know, living in the eighth sub-basement of a law firm doing computer work there, right? I'm not kidding, actually. I had to drive down seven floors and then go down a level to get to my office. Uh, <laughs> but, like, um, yeah, that was painful. Uh, and there was carbon monoxide detectors everywhere. Anyway. Um, <laughs> no, seriously. They didn't want to give us above-ground offices because they were too expensive. Um, and so they converted the bottommost floor of the parking garage. This is in Washington, D.C. So we're also under the water table, too, so it was awesome. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, so yeah, I felt like, you know, whenever I heard about uh, Dick Cheney going to his secret and disclosed location, I'm like, he could have used my old office, you know? <laughs> uh, anyway, so I don't know where I was going with that. But, but yeah, we had client server things that were just appallingly terrible to work with. And, and in a lot of ways, the web saved people from that, but they still didn't have the liveliness and the desktop sort of metaphors um, that they could rely on. And, and so there was a lot of clicking of submit buttons on forms, and, and this helped with that. And so I think it found like this natural home with literally millions of people who were developing using it. And it was, it was very rewarding to release. And, and I have to admit, you know, sometimes we release things and I think they're just terrible. You know, I'm like, or it's not the kind of thing that I'd be excited by. And, and often I'm wrong, and that's always really great to see. And it kind of goes back to the, there's open source for everything. It turns out people are driven by all kinds of problems that are really, really cool once you get into them, right? And, and maybe it's not the kind of thing that you personally would think is cool, but it's actually an engaging technical problem. And so this is one of those things where that happened. And then we're like, well, web browsers aren't fast enough. How can we make them faster? We tried a couple of ways of going about this with the established providers, and we finally decided what we really need is a new JavaScript interpreter. And so uh, a virtual machine. And so we wrote one. Uh, we had some folks in very northern climes in Scandinavia. Uh, and, and we also wanted to bring new features that were being supported by HTML5 into modern browsers. So, so, so that we could give people those desktop-like environments. And now, we could have stopped there and said, you know what, we don't need to open source this, we can just keep it closed or whatever, which would have been stupid, by the way, um, especially considering, you know, the open nature of Firefox and, and folks like that. But we decided in the end that, you know, what we wanted was to release this so that if other people decided that what we had done was good, that they could have, you know, either adopted um, some of the VM technology we use uh, in V8, which is the JavaScript renderer, um, or they could steal other components they might find useful 
uh, to make their web browsers better. But basically, Google depends on awesome web browsers continuing and, frankly, being competitive with each other, right? Any one browser dominating the market is very, very bad for Google, right? And, and IE, you know, to give you an example, Microsoft turns out they don't like us very much. And, <laughs> and so, so with Firefox doing so well, and we were very excited by that, um, and, and Firefox is a terrific competitor against IE. And, 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 and yet, there are some places where Firefox just doesn't exist. You know, there are parts of Asia, and, and we're like, why is that? What's going on? And, and a lot of times it came down to speed, and it came down to other factors that probably Firefox wasn't prioritizing, in our opinion. So we're like, well, maybe we can prioritize it and see if we're right. And in some cases we were, in most cases we weren't. And, you know, but still, we managed to get out this really high-performant browser that can do exciting things. So that was really, really very rewarding. And this is... You know, this is out, this is open source, mostly BSD, actually, along with a patent non assert. So the, the, the reason why we usually use Apache, by the way, is it's got this really terrific patent language. It says to you, the developer, the user, we say, listen, we, you, know, you can have this code, but we're not just giving you the code, we're giving you any patents we might own as well for you to use and for you to pass on to your users. And so when we release things under BSD, which doesn't have those patent clauses, we add them after the fact. We put them in the documentation. We say, listen, you're also getting a patent non-assert with these because we firmly believe in a defensive patent posture. We, f we actually believe we really need them because of the way patents work in the United States. But we want to make it really clear to developers and to the people who use our products that we're not using them against them. Right? We're using them really for protective purposes. And that's why we mostly use Apache. And when you see other licenses, we have the patent non asserts there. So let's keep going. And then we had Android. So Android. How many of you have ever had to develop for non-Android open, uh, uh, non-Android phones? So, like Symbian or something? Yeah? It was yeah? done in Java. It was done in Java, J2ME. So was that, would you say it was fun? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, so sometimes I give this talk to a lot of like mobile developers, and they're just like, they're so overjoyed by how easy it is to develop, both for the iPhone but also for the Android, that they're just like, wow, thank God, you know. And, and and what's funny about it is, you know, if you looked at cell phones three and a half years ago when we started the Android project, well, it starts a strong word, and I'll get to why. Um, you know, uh, Nokia Symbian had about seventy-five percent of the market. Windows Mobile had about 20%, uh, and then there was everyone else, like little Chinese operating systems that you'll find on, on Faco uh, phones in, in Shenzhen. Um, and, and by Faco, I mean like they're pretending they're iPhones, they're pretending they're, yeah. But there's also r real cell phones as well, and there's, <coughs> there's actually a lot of cell phone operating systems out there. You know, there's like Sony Ericsson, Favors One, I mean, anyway. Uh, and there were a couple of Linux phones uh, as well in China, but they never shipped out of China because of... Well, I won't go there. Uh, <laughs> and, and so we thought, you know, what the world, we think what the world needs, when you consider the advance of the ARM platforms out there, how performance-oriented they are, how fast they are, how wonderful they are, and how much capacity they have, is we need a really good smartphone operating system that anyone can adopt, whether they like us or not, and that means open source. And so we started, we started thinking about this, especially considering the competitive picture. We wanted cell phones to be more like the Internet, where everyone can compete. Everyone can compete against each other. Everyone can get to everybody. Uh, you, know, you, you know, if you don't like Google, which, by the way, I hope you do, but if you don't, you can go to Yahoo. You can go to Microsoft Live. You can go to Alta Vista. I'm sure they're still in business, right? <laughs> no, they probably are, right? I mean, so if you want to do that, nothing we can do will change that. I mean, besides the fact that we don't want to, there's nothing we can do to change that, right? And, and if you think of what can keep people from that kind of competitiveness, you know, it's, it's dominant, uh, market dominance, right? This is why Firefox is so important. This is why multiple browsers are so important. And this is why the desktop space is so crappy, right? You know, a lot of people feel that the Internet wouldn't have grown if the desktop hadn't been so terrible, if it hadn't been locked in by one company that was going to take everything from it. Anyway, um, so, so you see the cell phone market and you think, you know what? What we see is two dominant commercial players who don't have a good history of working with people, right? And so how can we fix that, right? Well, let's release it open source. And let's release it under the Apache license for the most part. Uh, it has a GPL Linux kernel, which is great. And the idea is that why don't we give somebody a new minimum bar, Right? You know, so even if you don't want to talk to us and, and make it like a Google experience phone, you can still ship a pretty amazing phone, you know. And, and, and we just took, for those of you who care about the money, 
We just took eight to fifteen dollars to twenty dollars if you're on the high end of some of the commercial operating systems off the bill of materials for these phones, and that's quite significant uh, for some of them. Um, for, for actually most of the smartphones, it's a very significant savings. And we've helped drive maybe an open source strategy for Symbian. Right? So that's pretty exciting stuff. Um, and, and it's a lot of open source code, you know? Uh, and it's all pretty good, and it's all pretty tailored to the embedded and phone market, right? Because uh, unfortunately, one of the things that's kept open source from happening uh, on phones is that it was made for large memory environments. It was made for environments that had a lot of disk space and all the rest, and where you could get away with certain things. Like, for instance, um, all of our internationalization is in the framework layer, and so we couldn't really use glibc's meg and a half of internationalization, right? A meg and a half of, of, of the space on here is significant, right? Especially when you think of phones that are less expensive than the smartphones out there, right? So we wanted to create something that could create that kind of environment, and also, we wanted to make it really fun to develop for. And so we ended up going, instead of for, with pure Java, we went with a different kind of virtual machine that allows for multiple you know, applications to do cool things together. You can go learn more about it later. And, I, and, and it was also awesome because we got to release about 10 million lines of code. Um, so that was pretty great. Uh, and then we think, okay, so that's where we are today. Um, we've released a lot of code, about 20 million lines of code across all the projects. And then what's coming up next? So we announced Google Wave at Google I.O. recently. Uh, it's, it's our rethinking of communications. And what we've released to date has only been protocols. It hasn't been source code. Um, we are going to open source it, which is, is, is cold comfort if you want to see the code now. But if you think about it, what's the point in bringing out yet another communication system that only one company's uh, things work with, right? And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to create a really cool way of communicating. And it's sort of like emerging of instant messaging, emailing, blogging, and every other buzzword you might think of, but it's actually really neat and not lame. And, and it'll crash your browser. And uh, <laughs> that's what that means, you know, all those buzzwords. And then, um, and then we want to find out a way of, of doing a fair kind of federation so that, you know, you could have, you know, Google Wave, but you could have, you know, your favorite ISP Wave, you could have your personal Wave, you know, whatever. Right, um, and and have those interact with each other in a fair way, while also trying to prevent spam, which is actually the hard part. It turns out, um, both federating and fighting abuse is they're orthogonal to each other almost. Um, and so, so, and so, when you have products like this, they're started from scratch. They're brand new. Whether it's Chromium, Android, Wave, you can you can target open source from the very beginning. And that's very appealing to me. And so, now we go into the future. Right? This is about you, really. Right? That last part was about me. This is about you. Um, so, how much more code are we going to be looking at? So, uh, right now, we're just a little above 3 billion lines of unique code and about 6.5 billion uses of those lines of code. Right? So, every line of code on the internet is used about twice, is sort of the long and short of it. Some are used an appalling amount. Like, for instance, uh, right now, the most used project that we can detect. It's probably Ghost Script. There's like one file in there, I guess, that every like open source project wanted to use at some point. We're still trying to verify that, so don't quote me on that. But you know, there's some appallingly popular projects, and then there's some that see no use at all, right? But on average, every line of code on the internet is used at least twice, and those are considered open source. We've we've classified them according to license. Um, we think by 2015 there'll be about two million self-identified open source developers. If, and and this is, these numbers are brought together in sort of the, actually the Red Hat way. So you don't know this, but Bob Young and I sat in a bar once, and we estimated how many people were using Linux, right? And we took the Linux counter and we multiplied it by the number of downloads at Red Hat times, you know, the, the Planck's constant and, and how many beers we had that day. We divided by that. And, and, and we came up with that number that was used early at Red Hat, by the way. Uh, <laughs> and and it, was, it was largely accurate. You know, we used a lot of real numbers to make a kind of a fake number, but you know, I mean, that's really all you got sometimes, right? And and so if you look at open source right now, there's a couple of hard numbers, right? And that's the number of projects like uh, registered at SourceForge and at code.google.com, and and we have about 250,000 projects registered, but aren't active, right? So then we think, well, what what does active mean? So if you look at the number of seven-day active projects today. It's only about seventy or eighty thousand, uh, and we think in about five years, you know, we could have three times as many. If you look at the number of non-unique 
you know, crossover projects. And, it, and this, is, this is sort of, I'm going off on a limb here, right? And we think that of the registered developers on the two sites, you know, each one probably has greater than a million users. Um, but realistically, how many of them are actually human beings? How many of them are not the same account? How many of them are not faded out accounts? Whatever, you know, again, that seven-day active problem. So I, I actually think the number of open source developers, people who have literally written a line of code and released it, um, by 2015 will probably be about 400,000. Um, and, that, and that'll be actually probably more of an effect of some of the interfaces you're seeing out there that just by, by virtue of using them, you create code. Um, and with your help, maybe even more. And, and it's funny because there's a lot of BS numbers in computer science. Um, like I once heard, and this was like in 1998, that there were 3 million Visual Basic developers, when it was clearly not the case, you know? Um, but, but I think that this is a pretty good number because it's actually growing, right? And, 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 and it's finally growing because there was a time between like 98 and 2003 where I wasn't seeing anyone new at conferences like this. Um, old hands in open source know this, right? And we're finally seeing new people. And I wish I, I could take credit for it from the Summer of Code, and maybe that's part of it. But, you know, were you a Summer of Code student? Yeah. Awesome. See, that's great. Um, good to meet you. Um, so, you know, but it, it is finally growing, and, and that's really good. And, and there's, I have a lot of thoughts as to why that's so, but there's only so much you want to hear me yammer about. Um, so let's get to you. Um, it's all about you. It's about your code, your patches, your projects, and your work, whether it's documentation or websites or whatever you can find to do for these projects that have really enriched us all. Um, and, and, and so all I ask is that you, you help. And so if you help, I promise I will too. And that's, that's all I can basically say. And I'm happy to take any questions until you're blue in the face. So, or until 10 minutes from now. So. You talked a little about Google Wave, and I'm yeah. really excited to start working on that and using that for my own projects. I was wondering if you have any idea when that will be opened up to the developers. So um, the first hunks of code, so what's funny about Google Web Toolkit is it was 95% open source, and there was a small hunk that wasn't released in the beginning, and then it was released like six months later. Um, and Android we announced like eight months ahead of time, and it always makes me nervous when we do that. But So the first real code, Right is coming out. Uh, I think in, in in July. If you go on the Wave Protocol discussion list, we've been talking about it there. Uh, and the first piece of code is actually a, a syncing tool for syncing waves and particles across uh, servers. So that'll give you something to start experimenting with. Because, uh, like for instance, uh, Miguel de Casa and some other people have already started implementing the Wave Protocol and different products, which is really shocking to us. We're like, oh my gosh, already? Really? No, no, wait, stop, you know. Um, but, but those guys are used to working with draft specs. They know that it's going to change. So um, read the protocol documentation, uh, get on the list, and you can either wait for the syncer to come out, or you can just go hop over to Miguel's project. I'm sure it'll be in C Sharp. And, um, and, and, go, and, and go help out there, you know, and see if that's appealing to you. you know, that's, that's what I would do. So, um, because we're, we're going to bring it out as soon as we can, but it may not be fast enough to satisfy you. So, yes, back in the back there. The browsers announced the OS and the underlying operating system. Does Google have a page that has weekly or monthly charts to show us popularity? Uh, of what? Of browsers? Not really. Um, you know, we have some numbers like that, but they're, they're weird, you know? I mean, because if you think about it, it's sort of like when people use search trends to tell you how popular something is. Well, no, that's just how people have searched for them, right? So we have a very search view of the world, right, which is how we derive our popularity numbers for things like browsers. We actually don't track operating systems on incoming too much. Again, it's very web-focused. Um, and, and we don't share that that often because we don't want to... Because we don't want to. <laughs> uh, I, I will say most of the numbers that are out there in the public, by the way, are already very, very accurate. So those aren't hard to come across. So browser penetration numbers, operating system penetration numbers. Um, so r really we wouldn't be adding anything um, except for down to maybe the local level, right? You know, like in, in Clemson, how many people are using Firefox? Yeah. And, and, and the problem is, you know, when, when you start doing information at that level, which is really what you have a hard time getting at, 
unless you have a really popular website, you actually start impacting personal privacy. And it's something we're incredibly sensitive about. And so often we'll err on the, on the side of not releasing data like that. So, sorry. There. I'd point with my laser, but I'd blind you. <laughs> um, so we have a developer version out now uh, for Linux and Mac. They're, they're pretty chunky. And by chunky, I mean they don't have, you know, uh, bookmark management's not great if it's there at all. I don't even think it's there at all in the Linux one. Uh, and plugins often will crash the browser and, and you know, things like that happen. Um, they're, they're alpha code, you know. <laughs> Believe me, we use beta all the time. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, um, you know, the nice thing about the developer samples that are going out now around Linux and Mac is one, you can get on the mailing list and, and, and the project and, and stay up with the nightlies. I think a bunch of even ships a nightly. Um, if you go to like our, our repo there. Um, but it's really fast. So it'll crash really quickly. Uh, no, no, seriously though, it's, it's actually not bad from a reliability standpoint. Um, better than IE6, right? But um, it'll, uh, it, it, if you're expecting like super stable and done, it's not done yet. We're thinking like probably another six months before it's something that we can reasonably call a good product or at least usable for more than 15 minutes at a time or whatever. But it's certainly fun to play with now. So if you're into that kind of thing, uh, the, the payment you'll, you'll pay is just a little bit of crashing. So. And, and it's a real pain in the butt to bookmark things, so how good is that, right? So. I think there's somebody over there. Yeah. Sorry, you're kind of blinded there. Are there, are there any plans for Adobe to go 64 bit in a point in the future? I have no idea. I'll find out, though. So just email me or get on the mailing list. Um, I think it's one of those things where... I don't know if there's anyone from Firefox here who can corroborate this. Uh, plugins really, really suck. And... Um, Having plugins that are 32-bit working inside a 64-bit environment can often suck more. Um, and then we, we try to wrap the, the individual tabs in their own process space, which it makes actually porting difficult. Uh, and then makes 64 to 32-bit transitions even more difficult. So uh, I don't know the answer to that. It's sort of the long and short of it. So, yeah? Uh, you can do that now. You can go to T-Mobile. There's a T-Mobile up Tiger Boulevard here. Uh, I'm sure they're happy to get one for you. Uh, uh, yeah, well, I don't know. It's not been so bad. You know, I've been getting a couple, you know. Oh, well, no, you can buy unlocked phones now. So you can just order them from from uh, from the site. They're a little more. I mean, it's, it, you traded freedom for $200 off, right? Um, <laughs> you know, and it's not that people haven't figured out how to unlock them either. But... Um, but yeah, you know, T-Mobile is actually not a bad person to buy a phone from, even even locked, because after you you've been a customer of theirs for 90 days, they're happy to give you the unlock code, and then you can go to town with new SIMs and the rest. I mean, you'll still have your two-year contract, but you know, I mean, that's the price you pay for a cheaper phone. Um, but yeah, you can you can order uh, developer phones, ADP one developer phones, which are the keyboard slide-out ones, um, uh, directly from us slash Brightstar, which is our fulfillment house for that. And then um, we'll have Sapphire soon enough. That's the, the that's this uh, that's the touchscreen version. So those will be up in the store soon enough. Probably a little more expensive, but um, yeah. So so if you if you really want to go unlock, that's the way to go. You'll end up maintaining it yourself. You won't get over the air updates from T-Mobile, you know. But you know, you're all hackers here, so that's easy. You know. Yes. Um, I'm starting to see in, in my circles Python belt picking up a lot more. Yeah. Uh, I haven't really categorized it by language, those, those lines of code. Um, I, I, I know what we see internally. And the problem is using Google as a replacement for the whole world is problematic. So Google's a funny place, right? We use a ton of Java. And then when things go slow because of the Javaness, which still happens, uh, although rarely, um, we move it over to C++, right? Um, there are some people who love Python, though. Like, we use, we use Python like crazy in the code.google.com team. Um, it's used by the groups team and, and a couple other teams. So Python's still a first-class language, but it's kind of a second first-class, right? And so, so yeah, I think Python is growing in popularity, and part of that has to do with Perl failing to advance. Um, but, you know, um, but I might be wrong, you know. Uh, I'll have differential numbers in about two weeks, 
and, and that'll chart the last six months at least of growth just on the internet of, of languages. But then we're really only measuring that code which has been released on the internet, right? So, so what does your gut say? How do you feel about it? I, I just, I'm seeing a pickup uh, you know, within my company specifically. Where do you work? What's that? Where do you work? Okay. And so sure. You haven't gone all Ruby? Definitely not. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's probably a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> but I've, I've, I've seen a dramatic shift from, you know, things, things like PHP to Python. Interesting. Within, within the last six months. Yeah, I think, I, you know, I have, I have this gut feeling about PHP, but I don't know if it's real. You know, I, I, I just feel like, like Perl is falling down because they're not advancing. PHP is falling down because it is advancing weirdly, you know. Um, so, but, you know, they're all fine. Um, but I, I do think that Python has been measured in how it changes, and that's appealing to people, so. Um, and at the same time, Ruby has gone crazy, but crazily, right? So, yeah. I, I only have a couple questions left, yeah. I, I think over time, as you look at what's in user bin, I think you're going to see the Python grow, and that's probably... Yeah, probably yeah, I think that's true. Uh, that's probably true. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There was a, a. Oh, Ryan. Hi, Ryan. Um, so I was curious what the relationship is between WebKit and Chromium. Is the goal to eventually supersede WebKit? No. No. I, well, you know, WebKit is sort of, you know, so WebKit's the HTML renderer, V8 is the JavaScript renderer, and um, no, I mean, we don't want to go away from WebKit. We want to, we want the main line of WebKit to be advancing, you know, well. And, and, and this is actually a problem with WebKit, in my opinion. I, I, I think that WebKit hasn't been advancing as well as it should have been. But I don't see us forking or anything crazy like that. Um, so, yeah. But there you go. I, you know, I, I, I wish that WebKit was moving a little faster, you know. So do, do we have time for one more? Hi. Awesome. Uh, my question is about Google Maps. Okay. Uh, there is a talk against this, which is OpenStreetMap, which is uh, who you would like to talk to if we could work out this problem. My problem is I do not know if it, it's legal for me to take a screenshot of a, a Google Map and uh, crop it to my desire and mm -hmm. re reuse it however I please. So what I've been doing is yeah. I've been doing it with OpenStreetMap. Okay. Um, what country are you in? United States. Okay, because if you were in England, it would be illegal to do any of those things. Uh, and there's a bunch of islands uh, off of Africa where it's also illegal. The, the Queen owns all the maps in England. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I actually, I'm not familiar with the terms of service of Google Maps. Um, we try to encourage people to use the embedding API because it's, it's nicer. Um, and I think there's a static image sort of service where you can grab the image you want from Google Maps. Uh, OpenStreetMaps is great, though. So, I mean, if it's working for you, more power to you. Um, I, I honestly don't know what the terms of service for Google Maps says about pulling static images. Because we actually want to move people away from that. Because static images are the way of death in our mind, you know, because they don't update, you know, new things show up. You can't search nearby for hotels, you know. <laughs> yeah, they're fine for books, sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Books, those things with paper. Are you taking like ebooks, like a Kindle or something? Uh, yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah. No. I. You can email me and I can find out. I mean, the, you know, the problem with with uh, with maps in general actually is often the imagery isn't owned by the people giving it to you, right? Um, it's actually very rare. For you, well, it's actually impossible to give a global map and have all the imagery owned by one one company to give you the right to do that sometimes. So, and, and also it might be the kind of thing where we can give you a static map for, you know, parts of Cabo San Lucas, uh, much of the United States, some parts of Canada, but not Texas uh, in Austin on the right side of the street. You know, I mean, there's a lot of situations like that. And it sounds ridiculous because it is, but <laughs> it's just, it's the way of intellectual property in the United States and the world. So, what do you do? I'm sorry? Dick Cheney's house. Dick Cheney's house, yeah. <laughs> Barbara Streisand's house, yeah, whatever. You know, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of a funny world. And it's like, you know, was Dick Cheney any safer because we had his house be slightly blurrier? You know? And what's funny about it is it wasn't us blurring it, right? Because since we buy satellite data, 
from Digital Globe and others. Digital Globe has to clear their imagery strategy with the uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, who clears with the, uh, you know, NASA in some cases and FCC with others. So, I mean, it's a very complicated picture of satellite imagery, right? And if you have it lower than, you know, one pixel per six inches, then these organizations are going to want to have a say in your image pipeline. I mean, it's incredibly complex, right? So, so the answer is often as complex. Well, you know, well, where is that static image? Well, it's outside of Clemson on this one street. Oh, okay, well, in that case, we're going to be using, you know, nav tech tiles that were derived from an original Teleatlas database, which came from the Queen of England. And it's like, what? You know, uh, and in that case, the answer would be no. But in the case where we ourselves drew it or we had a street view car tracing some line, well, then okay, you know. So it's kind of ridiculous, and I wish it wasn't, so. But sometimes they're not ours to give. And I, and I think that's it. He's, he's like, you know. <laughs> I have a laser. Um, so, so thank you for having me, and thank you for running the show. This work was recorded by View Digital Media and is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution, share alike version 3.0. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit southeastlinuxfest.org.